In the Airframe Structures series of lessons, we will define the various loads applied to aircraft structures. Looking at the design and construction of the fuselage, wings and tail unit. We will examine the materials used in construction and the effects of corrosion and fatigue on these materials. We will discuss the effects of a hard landing on the airframe and we will review failure statistics and their importance in safe aircraft design. In this first lesson, we will discuss the various loads applied to aircraft structures, both on the ground and in flight. We will examine the effect of fatigue on structures and discuss the methods used to mitigate these effects. A tensile load is one which tends to stretch a structural member. The member is then said to be under tension. Components designed to resist tensile loads are known as ties. Good examples of ties are the stringers, which in modern aircraft take the tensile loads produced in the fuselage structure by pressurization. Compressive loads are the opposite of tensile loads and tend to shorten structural members. Members subject to compressive loads are said to be under compression. Components designed to resist compressive loads are known as struts. You will find numerous examples of struts in an aircraft landing gear. The primary one being the oleopneumatic strut which takes the compressive loads on landing. This will be fully explained in the landing gear lesson. Shear is a force which tends to slide one face of the material over an adjacent face. Riveted joints are designed to resist shear forces. Rivets are being used in this picture to fasten the fuselage skin to the frame. In modern aircraft, they are being replaced by adhesive bonding processes. To review tensile compressive or shear loads, click one of the three buttons. Most loads to which aircraft components are subjected are a combination of two or all three of these basic loads. Bending of the structure involves the three basic loadings. They are tension as the outer edges stretch, compression as the inner edges squeeze together, and shear across the structure as the forces try to split it. Torsion or twisting forces produce tension at their outer edge, compression in the center, and shear forces across the structure. Buckling occurs to thin sheet materials when they are subjected to end loads and to ties if subjected to compressive forces. To review bending, torsion or buckling, click one of the three buttons. Stress is the internal force inside a structural member which resists an externally applied force and therefore a tensile load or force will set up a tensile stress and a compressive load compressive stress. Stress is defined as the force per unit area and is measured in newtons per square millimeter or meganewtons per square meter. When an external force of sufficient magnitude acts on a structure, the structural dimensions change. This change is known as strain. Strain is measured as a ratio of the change in a material's length to its original length and is a measure of the deformation of any loaded structure. 
In our extreme example shown here, the original length of the material is 2 meters. When a tensile load is applied, its length increases to 2.5 meters. This gives it an increase in length of 0 0.5 meters. Therefore, the strain being felt by this material is 0 0.5 divided by 2, which is 0 0.25. The 18th century English physicist Thomas Young discovered that the relationship between stress and strain for an elastic material within the elastic limit of the material is generally a constant. This constant is therefore known as Young's modulus of elasticity. Aircraft components are subjected to some or all of these stresses and they will tend to elongate, compress, bend, shear and twist the component. However, provided the deformation is within the elastic limit of the material, the component will return to its original dimension once the stress has been removed. If any load takes the structure beyond its elastic limit, then the deformation will be permanent. The maximum load that a designer would expect an airframe or component to experience in service is termed the design limit load. This load is defined as a load factor. Load factor is the ratio of the lift of an aircraft to the weight of the aircraft. The load factor is expressed in multiples of g. In straight and level flight, lift is equal to weight. So the ratio of lift to weight is 1 and the load factor is 1g. The design limit load is 2.5g for public transport aeroplanes. The design limit load is 3.4 to 3.8g for utility aircraft and 6g for aerobatic aircraft. The design ultimate load is the design limit load multiplied by a safety factor. The minimum safety factor specified in design requirements is 1.5. The structure must withstand its design ultimate load without collapse. The safety factor is the ratio of the design ultimate load to the design limit load. The aircraft manufacturer will attempt to design an aircraft to take into account all the loads that it may experience in flight. There are various guidelines, formula and experience to help them in the design of good, fail-safe and damage-tolerant structures. The designer will take into account the anticipated role of the aircraft. So, for instance, aircraft designed for long-haul operations should not be used for short haul as the extra takeoffs and landings will not have been accounted for in the airframe's anticipated fatigue life calculations. The safe life of an aircraft structure is defined as the minimum life during which it is known that no catastrophic failure will occur. All critical components have a safe life, which may be measured in flying hours, landings, pressurization cycles, or even on a calendar basis. After the permitted safe life count has been reached, the relevant item is replaced or overhauled. During the operational life of the aircraft, to minimize the effects of metal fatigue, aircraft designers apply the principles of fail-safe or damage-tolerant construction. A fail-safe structure is based on the principle of component redundancy. It has multiple load paths in parallel, which means that the loads are shared by adjacent members. Therefore, 
If one part fails, the load will be carried by the adjacent member for a limited period. This must be until at least the next periodic inspection. The disadvantage of dueling the load paths is that it is very expensive in terms of weight as each of the members has to be strong enough to do the work for both. It is now only normally used for wing and stabilizer attachment points. The bracing struts between the wings and the fuselage of the short sky van for instance are each made up of three members. This design philosophy must be accompanied by a maintenance program to ensure that failures are detected before they progress too far. To gain access to vulnerable areas, a certain amount of dismantling is usually required, although non-destructive testing may be used in less critical areas. Modern concepts of aircraft design employ the stressed skin style of construction where each piece of the airframe, including the stressed skin, plays its part in spreading loads throughout the entire airframe and is tolerant to a certain amount of damage. These damage tolerant structures eliminate the extra structural members needed in a fail-safe design by spreading the loading of a particular structure over a larger area. Damage tolerant structures are designed to withstand a certain amount of damage, which again should be detected during the normal inspection cycle before a failure occurs. A structure which is subject to continual reversals of loading, such as the landing gear or the fuselage of a pressurized aircraft, will fail at a load of less than would be the case for a steadily applied load. This is known as fatigue. The failure load level will depend on the number of reversals experienced. In high cycle fatigue situations, a material performance can be graphically characterized by an SN curve, also known as a Vola curve. This is a graph of the magnitude of the cycle stress, S, against a logarithmic scale of cycles to failure, N. It can be seen that after 100 cycles, at 80% of the ultimate stress, the specimen will fail. But if the stress is reduced to 30% of the ultimate, then the component will fail after 10,000 cycles. A method of locating components on the aircraft must be established in order that maintenance and repairs can be carried out. This is achieved by using reference lines to identify positions fore and aft, left and right, and from top to bottom. Fuselage station numbers are determined by reference to a zero datum line, which is at or near the nose of the aircraft. On some aircraft, such as the one shown here, it is forward of the nose. Station numbers are identified in inches or millimetres forward or aft of the zero datum. Stations forward of the datum are identified with a minus sign and aft with a plus sign or no sign at all. In this installation, they are all aft of the datum, so no sign is used. Wing station numbers are measured in inches left or right of the aircraft centerline. Vertical position is identified from the horizontal datum. These positions are known as water lines or buttock lines and are measured in inches from the datum. Plus is used for locations above and minus for locations below the datum. In this example, the datum is at the bottom of the extended landing gear.
The fuselage is the main structure of the aircraft. It carries the aircraft payload, be it passengers or freight, as well as the crew in safe, comfortable conditions. It also provides the crew with an effective position for operating the aircraft and space for controls, accessories and other equipment. The fuselage transfers loads to and from the wings, tailplane, fin, landing gear and in some configurations the engines. Modern aircraft fuselages are pressurized and these pressurized aircraft structures must also be capable of withstanding axial and hoop stresses imposed by the pressurization forces. Axial or longitudinal stresses are set up in the fuselage of aircraft when pressurized and tend to elongate the fuselage between the front and rear pressure bulkheads. Hoop or radial stresses, also caused by pressurizing the fuselage, tend to expand the fuselage's cross-section area. The hoop or radial stresses are of greater significance than the axial stresses. The differential pressures that set up these stresses can be as high as 65.5 kilonewtons per square meter or 9.5 pounds per square inch. This is the end of the lesson. You should now know that tensile loads are resisted by ties, that compressive loads are resisted by struts, and the meaning of the terms stress and strain. You should know the meaning of the term Young's modulus of elasticity. And you should also understand the relationship between design limit load and design ultimate load and the safety factor. You should also know what the design limit load is for various types of aircraft. And finally, you should understand the properties of fail-safe and damage-tolerant structures.